Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 38 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. This is a very special episode dedicated to our good friend and neighbor Jim, who died unexpectedly two weeks ago. I'm sharing a very personal reflection that started as a blog post, doing double duty as writing therapy for me to process the amazing range of thoughts and feelings that can come, you know, with loss and grief. I'm sharing it as a podcast because... There isn't any adult who hasn't suffered some sort of unexpected loss of a family member or friend. It's universal. And it's the demonstration of our impermanence and the principle of life and the principle of the Buddha Dharma that we all try to find a way to accept. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder, but we've all been there and we all know how our tough it can be to steer our way through the, the, the crazy waves of grief and loss. I'm also sharing it, though, because I talk about the importance of community through grief and through all our journeys in life. The blog post behind this podcast can be found on the membership community area of the Everyday Buddhism website www.everyday-buddhism.com. As I discussed in the last podcast, we've been working hard on building an integrated membership community for those that might want to explore beyond just the public Facebook group and or who aren't able to join the Everyday Sangha. This membership community is now live thanks to the partnership and support of one of my Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism lay minister colleagues, Levi Shinyo Walbert. Levi Shinyo Sensei, Sensei helped me build a YouTube channel for us, and he will also be contributing content and guidance to the new membership community, as well as helping lead the Everyday Sangha and creating special bonus podcasts with me. And it's exciting to announce that our first bonus members-only podcast is recorded and ready to listen to when you become become a member of the new community. As a review, the membership community offers more discussion, more teachings, more podcasts. All these features are part of the uh, bonus extras of the member community at the $5 a month level. Some of the extras are one special bonus podcast for members members only that will not be public. By the way, we already have one up there for your listening pleasure right now. Um, Number two, two blog sections with articles, blogs, and Dharma glimpses from Sensei's Wendy Shinyo Halet, that's me, and Levi Shinyo Walbert. Um, The blog post behind this upcoming podcast uh, that I just wrote is already up there. Links to private YouTube videos and live feeds on our new YouTube channel is the uh, third benefit. And the fourth is a private secret Facebook group for those who still prefer Facebook. And fifth, a member chat area on the membership community page of the Everyday Buddhism website where you can be part of the exclusive members-only chat. And on that chat, you can actually ask questions so that they can be featured on a regular Ask Me Anything podcast. So join now so you don't miss out on the bonus features that are already there and those that we're planning for the future. Just go to www everyday-buddhism.com and click on the tab that says join community or sangha. From there, you can join the membership community 
and or the Everyday Sangha. Now, the Sangha is a virtual Sangha meeting via Zoom video conference at 7.30 p.m. Eastern U.S. time every other Thursday evening. It is a wonderfully warm and loving place to support each other in the practice that is life and learn more tips and tricks and share what you're learning. The next Sangha meeting is this very Thursday, February 6th, and we meet every other week again on Thursday evenings. And of course, one more note, if you haven't yet, please go to the go to Amazon and purchase a copy of my newly released, best-selling and five-star rated book, Everyday Buddhism: Real Life Buddhist Teachings and Practices for Real Change. It's available in both ebook, ebook and paperback. And as soon as I can get a little more time, it will also be coming out in an audio book. Pick one up for yourself or to share with someone who might need it or like it to guide them in the coming year. And when you've finished it, please go back to Amazon to review the book. Reviews are very important, so let's get the number of reviews up there so more people can discover the book the podcast, and our growing everyday Buddhism way of being in the world. So thanks for your patience through these announcements. And now it's on to this brief, special dedication episode titled, And Yet, And Yet. Our good friend and neighbor Jim died two weeks ago. Suddenly, unexpectedly, at 59 years old. You know, he had knee replacement surgery about three months ago, getting new parts and ready to go, ready to be more mobile in his second half of life. But he didn't make it to that second half. And honestly, it sucks. Death is, of course, part of the Buddhist impermanence I write about, podcast about, and teach about. It's the first noble truth. Crappy things happen. And this felt particularly crappy. I was shocked. I was angry. And a whole bunch of other tumultuous emotions, like many in his extended network of friends and neighbors. And his family felt much worse. Because a husband, a father, a brother, a son, an uncle was snatched from them. I did meta practice and prayers the morning of his death, but I remained dazed with a mix of that anger and depression. Where to turn? What to do when death grabs one of our family or friends? For me, all I could do was to remind myself of what I knew was the first principle of life, that everything dies and that nothing is certain. And then I let myself fall back into the currents of grief. And I kept repeating the haiku by Kobayashi Isa. This world of do is a world of do, and yet, and yet. Isa, the Japanese poet and lay Buddhist priest who lived in the late 1700s, wrote this poem capturing the yetness of our human existence after the loss of his young children. I've quoted Isa many times after a death, and that and yet and yet part expressed that feeling of, yeah, yeah, I know we all die and nothing stays the same, but it's crappy, it sucks, it hurts. It shakes you to your core, whatever your core is. Or if we really have a core, everything becomes so topsy-turvy after a close death, a close loss. That and yet and yet express those moments of realization after a death, where all your theoretical balance of the teachings and impermanence tip and fall, falling on you, revealing the very heavy weight of life's seeming precariousness. Mostly, we balance this realization of our own and others' impermanence 
like on the top shelf of a closet in a dark room of our mind. It's easy to forget it's there, until a little shake of the closet tips it all over at your feet, and there it is. We read about life's impermanence, and in my case, teach, write, and speak about it, as if it only existed spilled on the floor outside of someone else's closet. But then, when the little shake spills it all out at our own feet, well, there's only, and yet, and yet. I had always thought of this, and yet, in the negative. As in, for example, in Issa's poem, he is firmly aware that the world is like dew. He knows this in his mind. In his mind, trapped in those boxes of concepts, precariously balanced on the top shelf of the closet in the dark room, until they fell at his feet. No longer concepts, but real, lived suffering. This is what the end yet and yet implied to me. But in walking through the first days after Jim's death, I became aware of another lived meaning of and yet. Not only the meaning of nevertheless it hurts, but also but yet, but yet, as in there are other ways you can show up. There are other ways you can walk through the experience with an openness to this other part of yet, the part that asks you, what else can you do for family and friends? What else can you do for yourself and your loved ones to use this death for growth, for good? Our neighborhood is a suburban neighborhood that in part lives like a small town. We talk to each other and know each other's kids and extended families. We look out for each other when someone is sick or if there's an emergency. We eat together sometimes and celebrate events and even pick vegetables from each other's gardens. Following Jim's death, we, the neighborhood, met in driveways or in the street to hug. There was a crowd at Jim's house, a crowd of friends, family, and neighbors to support Jim's immediate family. You know, my partner and I had semi-planned to go to Jim's calling hours when it was announced, but not the funeral service, which was held immediately after. Both were held at the family's church nearby our neighborhood. And when the day of the funeral came, we felt, though, what I could only characterize as a call to stay beyond just the calling hours for the funeral service. As a Buddhist, I don't go to a local church, Christian or otherwise, not because I'm against it, but more about not finding a a spiritual community that felt comfortably aligned with my, I don't know, spiritual sensibilities, my Buddhist beliefs. And my partner too, as a sole practitioner of A Course in Miracles, felt similarly. Yet, We have often felt a desire to find a spiritual community we could participate in together. And here's where the other part of and yet comes in. The showing up. When we walked into that church, we recognized friends and neighbors, but also many, many, many strangers as a part of Jim's extended family of friends and community and church members but yet it felt surprisingly comfortable. There wasn't the feeling of just being there to support the family, but a sense of it's good to be here. It felt nourishing and supportive of my own grief. There was a cross up on the altar, not with the crucified Jesus, hymnals and Bibles in every pew. That was okay. My Buddhist sensibilities were not offended. It was not about me, after all. Yet, in an odd way, it was. In the showing up. In the immersion of my own grief into that community of people. All just like me, but grieving in their own ways for whatever relationship they lost when Jim died. 
I understood the power of a neighborhood church or of church that becomes family even outside your neighborhood. I understood the power of a minister that talks of gospels and the Lord's Prayer, not the sutras, and a congregation that sings hymns and not chants. And that showing up and yet became a way to open to shared grief and be healed, at least for a moment. In that showing up, and yet, also became a way to see the false borders of belief and concepts disappear in our shared human precariousness. In our shared precariousness and impermanence, in our world of dew, clouded by the tears in our eyes and the love in our hearts. This is dedicated to our good friend and neighbor, Jim, who will never be forgotten. That's it for this this episode of Everyday Buddhism, Making Everyday Better. I hope you can find a, a way to build, contribute, or just participate in a community as support for the ups and downs in life. And go give your family and friends a big hug.